first, can you explain to us what social media marketing is and what kinds of data are useful to marketers? Sure. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. And social media marketing really started as an organic channel to engage people, to put yourself out there, to for a brand specifically to be a little bit more human. And when social media was born, it very much was this like, okay, this is the chance for that tone to really come through, to engage, to be human. And it's grown into what I use it for is a full funnel marketing channel. And by full funnel, I mean, top of the funnel is a lot of the brand building work as we would call it. But up at the top of the funnel, that's where we're talking about that TV work, think Super Bowl spots, those things that really put the brand first and the brand out there so that you feel like it's a brand for me. And when I say bottom funnel or lower funnel, I mean the things that you can click on right here from Instagram and you can say, buy these sneakers right now. So when I say full funnel, social media has grown from this engagement channel to this full blown, I can tell you a story even a long form story down to a retargeting piece of content that is like, Hey, I can tell you came to the website and you look at these sneakers, but you didn't buy them. What if I gave you 20% off and I can reach you that way. And it's exciting as a marketer to have a channel that can do so much, but it also requires us to be even smarter about how we use it and more respectful of the attention we're asking for. Because when you are in that lean back mode, chilling at night, going through your feed, what really is an appropriate message or thing to ask you to do in that moment? And what is appropriate information to act on in a way that doesn't feel creepy? <laughs> that is a word that we use a lot in marketing when it comes to targeting and in a way that feels respectful of the medium that you're using and that mindset that you're in. Um, to get to your second question, the type of information that's helpful, honestly, is candid, unfiltered reactions to things. And I'll start there because yes, information on demographics or psychographics, psychographics being like lifestyles, interests, behavior, um, about geography, regional. If you are a regional brand or you need to heavy up, as we would call it, in an area where maybe people don't know as much about you or don't know you for a certain thing, then it's nice to have those types of triggers available for us to then target media against. It really is that two-way street. We are putting something out there and we can get immediately immediate feedback in the comments. We can get it through um, sentiment. We have tools that can, get, can look at those sorts of things. Positive, negative, neutral can give us a word cloud of types of words. I love this or I hate this. The hating is equally as helpful for us. And that's really the most helpful information, at least for advertisers to say, are we, what we're putting out into the world, is it relevant? Yeah. Sentiment is mood. It's an idea of positive, negative, or neutral feelings towards something and how with social data, we have tools that use machine learning and sentiment analysis to try to pick up on cues that like, I love this would be positive. I hate this would be negative. But there's also a lot of in between where computers are getting better. They're still not good at sarcasm, but are getting better at picking up the emotions that are in people's words and even images these days. And then that's how they calculate sentiment. Thank you. So last few years have been incredible as it relates to user data collection. I mean, we know since 2003, we have never collected this much data in the history of all marketing and advertising, right? So, you know, within these last two years, what are the benefits of consumers kind of having an online targeted experience or personalized versus them not doing anything in the company, not knowing anything about them. So what are the benefits of personalization and consumers actually providing data that would benefit them? A, a, definitely a huge benefit is you just have a better experience when the content you're receiving is relevant. If, even if it is ads and it's sponsored content that's appearing in your feeds, because it's relevant to what you're also doing in that moment or looking at, it is just a better experience for you to then say, oh, hey, maybe I could find value if I were to check this out and click on this link. Um, the other thing too is a value of personalization is help me get to what kind of sneakers I need faster. 
a lot of times with some of those signals that we talked about, the kind of data that can come back to us, likes, interests, who you follow, the types of things you engage with, can help a sneaker brand realize that I'm a runner, I'm not someone who does CrossFit. And the quicker I can get to shoes that feel right for me, the sooner I can get those shoes and I don't have to send them back because, oh, I really like the way those looked, but they're not the right shoes for me. And then it it just elongates my experience with that brand. And then it starts to get a little crunchy, as we like to say, in impacting how you view the brand or you view that product and how you view running. Because I'll just be a human being for a second. If I was super excited about these shoes and these were the ones that were going to get me out of bed and get me in shape because it's new year resolution and then they don't come then it's also a detriment to just me and my life and my goals in a way. So I know that gets a little bit, um, you know, I would say philosophical for lack of a better word, but truly the things that we buy and the things that relate to us and, and plans we have for the things that we purchase as we wait for them can have a huge impact on our experience with it and our lives in general. So personalization does help us with decision-making helps us get there faster with having a better experience or not kind of recognizing like maybe this isn't for me and being able to rectify something sooner. I think there was a rule a long time ago, a long time ago, wasn't that long when Instagram first started doing paid ads and you could only see it was like one or two ads a day. Like that was actually what Instagram was gatekeeping how many ads. Now that's not the case today, but when you think about it back then, advertisers had to really make sure that they were worthy of the feed because it was like Instagram was looking at those ads and saying, if you don't fit here and you inter- interrupt the feed and why people are here, then like try again. And that was really great for advertisers at a time when digital was very much lower funnel. Like I talked about earlier, which was use this and like yell at someone with a promo code and get them to convert mattress sale, as we would say, like buy, buy, buy. And social, I think, helped advertisers pull back out and say, if we're going to fit here, this is actually more like a story medium. And we need to think about that first before we go in there and we start knocking on doors and selling vacuum cleaners. So I really appreciate what social did for this industry because it helped us get back to storytelling. So Lauren, I think you've convinced me there are lots of benefits, but uh, in the spirit of the yin and the yang, I have to ask the question about, you know, what do companies like, you know, Apple, Google, Amazon, and all these others who do collect a lot of information, how have they recently provided consumers with maybe more control over their information and their information privacy? Yeah, that's a great question. With with all of the good of social, there certainly is a lot of that, that bad that can come if you're not aware of what's being collected. Or if brands aren't being ethical or decent about what they're collecting and how they're using it. And I'll I'll pick out pick out Apple first, because what they've done is they have doubled down on privacy as a value, so much so that they've put money into like Super Bowl-esque commercials to communicate that to us. And how they are doing that is not just telling us, hey, it's on you you know, to watch what you're giving. And oh, we all just say, oh, new terms and and conditions, except move on. They have said, no, we're actually putting controls in place where we are going to nudge you, behavioral science. We are going to nudge you every now and then to say, do you want this app to be sharing information with other apps? If you don't, just click here. Do you want this app to have to be listening that you want the microphone to be on at all times? Yes or no? Here's how you do it. Also, here's how you notice if an app is listening to you, the dot up in the corner of the newer phones. So what Apple has done is they've not only made it a value and communicated that, they are walking the walk in how they have designed technology solutions to remove temptations, to help us turn things off, to help us take that beat. So that's how Apple has done a really good job And then some of the other social networks as well, and some of the brands have made a point to ask, you know, do you feel comfortable with what's being collected? Do you understand what is going on? And sometimes we listen and sometimes we don't, Um, but hopefully just enough nudges can get us to take that beat and pay attention. And 
it's nice when the ownership isn't 100% on us because we know if it's on us, the the human beings, it's not going to happen. We're going to continue going about our day. Um, but if a brand can step up and give us that moment to just ask us, then brands that are doing that are going to win in the next few years. And you believe that there are going to be um, more and more companies um, kind of taking that approach? I think so. And whether we know about it or not, I'm not sure. And and what I mean by that is I, I think a lot of companies are having their own reckoning of sorts and they're seeing what's happening with data breaches. They're seeing what's happening with marketing. That's just like a little bit too, like there's personalized and then there's intimate. And you're like, how did you know that? I don't know why I felt like I was just talking about this and now I'm getting ads for it. Like who's listening? So I do think that a lot of companies are, if if they're smart, are looking at their technology stacks. They're looking at their pixels that they've put on websites and what's being collected there. Because if you have a pixel that's collecting a form field, then where is that information being stored or hashed or how is it being transmitted? So we'll see if other brands step up and start communicating it. So yeah, it's, it's, I hope it's happening. And um, if brands aren't taking steps now, they're going to be the next ones in the headlines. What are your thoughts on the future in general communication, how consumers are going to be knowing, you know, the way Gen Z is in terms of their views or Gen Alpha coming up that they're more decision makers, what type of platform, you know, if we could, obviously, you know, determine the platforms would be billionaires right now, but what else is coming? What's the need based on everything we know out in the marketplace, but based on these privacy and tracking? It's such a great question. And back when social was really getting going, it was all about being connected, like having connected experiences. But what has been interesting is with all of the benefits that personalization can bring, it's also very isolating because you're having your very own experience and it makes it less talk worthy in the sense that you would see a commercial and then at the water cooler, (laughs) to be quick, the water cooler, you would talk about it. Hey, did you see this? Hey, did you watch this? Did you catch that last night? And I'm seeing this, and this is just purely my hypothesis. I'm I'm seeing that this idea of co-watching in the sense of these shows that we all seem to watch in the sense that since we're coming out of COVID, a lot of the streaming platforms are doing the episode by episode every Friday releases. They're not releasing the whole season all at once. And what that's doing, because I'm one of them, is, hey, did you see it? No, I didn't see it. Don't tell me. I'm going to watch it tonight so we can talk about it tomorrow. So it is sort of bringing that like Friday night, everybody watches the same thing or Sunday you know, everybody watches the same thing outside of just sports. It's bringing that back. And I think that we can use more of that connecting over these collective experiences. We just saw, we all had it in COVID. That was one version of it. But I think content and shows or podcasts or things that we could all look forward to together and consume together, even commercials. I think in advertising, it's going to be a return to more broadcast, more of the storytelling kind of content that's more at the top of the funnel than at the bottom to get people to feel like they're part of a community again. So it was just so interesting to to be on this ride with social where it's, yes, it's about connected experiences and your community, but oh, now it turns out maybe you've been a little too myopic in the one community that you chose or has been chosen for you by algorithms. So how do we get back out of that and have more of these collective experiences, not just connected so that we can have more things to talk about at the water cooler or insert today's reference point for that in the kitchen at the office. So that's my hypothesis, more collective experiences over connected experiences. And I think that will be a good thing for all of us as human beings to talk about things together again and not have as many personalized or isolated experiences as the only experience we're having with social. 